Well, why is that important? Well, it's important because there are studies that were done in the 1950s showing that if you feed sugar to animals, that they become pre-diabetic and fat. They develop what we call the metabolic syndrome, where your triglycerides go up, your HDL cholesterol falls, you develop insulin resistance, you get obesity, you get intra-abdominal fat, you get inflammation, you get fatty liver. And when further studies were done, it was shown that it wasn't just sugar that did it, it was the fructose element. You could give animals fructose or the animal starch, and only the fructose or sugar-fed animals will develop pre-metabolic syndrome or pre-diabetes. This is a study we did. We took rats and we pair fed them. So this group got glucose or starch and this group got fructose. They ate the exact same number of calories. But blood pressure goes up in the fructose fed animals, triglycerides go up, HDL cholesterol goes down, insulin resistance develops only in the fructose fed animals. We've even shown that you can starve an animal, you can restrict its caloric intake, but if you give it fructose, it won't gain weight because it's being starved, when you open it up at sacrifice, there's a dramatic increase in intra-abdominal fat, insulin resistance, hypertriglyceridemia, and all the factors that we know lead to diabetes. So why is fructose different from glucose? Well, fructose is different from glucose because of its first three enzymes involved in its metabolism. Fructose enters cells through a specific transporter where it's metabolized by an enzyme called fructokinase. Fructokinase is an unregulated enzyme. Unlike glucokinase, which metabolizes glucose, glucokinase generates ATP, uh, the glucose pathway generates ATP, and you never see ATP uh, depletion. But with fructose, you become energy depleted. Remember, your primary energy is, comes from ATP, and ATP gets burned and then consumed. So you get this rapid burn, and then you get this uh, ATP depletion. And if you give fructose on cells, even at the concentration you get from drinking one soft drink, one millimolar will, will deplete the energy of the cell by 30 to 40 percent and protein synthesis will arrest. And we've shown that, it's been shown by other groups. We've shown in endothelial cells, hepatocytes, tubular cells, adipocytes, you know, all kinds of cells in the body, and it's been shown in humans. If you give an injection of fructose to a human, you can measure ATP or energy in their liver and it goes down dramatically by NMR and also by specific biopsy. Well, the other thing that happens is this leads to the generation of uric acid, which is specific for fructose. And uric acid levels go up in the blood after you eat a sugar meal and it can go up quite dramatically in some. In fact, the more sugar you eat, the higher, more sensitive you become these enzymes go up and you get a higher response. Well, why do we care about uric acid going up in the blood? Well, because there's been this long association of uric acid with cardiovascular disease and obesity. In fact, the original paper on high blood pressure by Frederick Muhammad pointed out that the people who develop high blood pressure tend to come from families where gout is common or where uric acid is elevated. Muhammad, in 1879, actually proposed uric acid to be a cause of hypertension. And yeah, that was the first paper on hypertension. So, interestingly, no one had ever done the experiment. No one had ever said, what happens when you take a rat and raise its uric acid? You would think that would have been an obvious experiment. We who go to medical school know that the way you prove things is you take an animal and you raise that particular factor and you see what happens. And the reason it hadn't been done is because humans are different from most mammals we had a mutation in uric acid metabolism, so we have high uric acids, but in the mouse they have, and the rat, they have this enzyme that degrades uric acid to a lantern. So it turns out that you give uric acid to a rat, doesn't go up in their blood at all. You give them a high fructose meal, it's pretty hard to get their, their, their uh, uric acid to go up, unless you give huge doses. So what we did is we, we uh, we took animals and we gave them a uric case inhibitor to kind of humanize them. And when we did that, we raised their uric acid about two or three fold. And the amazing thing happened was that these animals started developing hypertension. When my fellow came and told me that, I said, I can't, that can't be. If uric acid caused high blood pressure, the whole world would know it. But it is true that 60% or 70% of people with high blood pressure have a high uric acid, but we always thought it was secondary. So I had them do 100 animals before we submitted the paper. And we also had them lower the uric acid. And when we did, we did it two different ways. 
we could lower the blood pressure. So when we looked at the mechanism, we found that uric acid was inhibiting endothelial cell function. And it inhibited a substance called nitric oxide, which is a gas that keeps the blood vessels healthy. And the discoverer that got the Nobel Prize a few years ago. But uric acid directly inhibited that endothelial nitric oxide. More excitingly, the animals started developing microvascular disease in their kidneys. And this is the same lesion you see in essential hypertension. 90% of people with high blood pressure have that exact lesion. No one knew the cause. And here we had this lesion developing. Well, this is particularly important because there's in growing evidence that this microvascular lesion causes hypertension. And in fact, um, and we went on and showed that the uric acid got in the cell and it activated and caused that uh, disease as a direct effect through a lot of uh, molecular mechanisms. So it turns out that microvascular disease, if you induce it in the kidney, you can develop hypertension. And this has now been shown in over 10 models. And in fact, this was one of my major areas of research, where we were showing that if you activate the renin angiotensin system or stimulate the sympathetic nervous system or cause endothelial dysfunction, you could create these lesions, and then you could get rid of the original initiating stimulus, and now the kidney drives the hypertension. So we wondered, could the uric acid be doing that? So what we did is we gave that uric case inhibitor, which raised the blood pressure, and we did it under a low-salt diet because it could ma ma um, maximize the change. And at this point, the, this hypertension is driven by the nitric oxide and by the uric acid. If I lower uric acid, blood pressure will come down. But over time, they get that vascular lesion. And now when I stop the uh, uh, uric case inhibitor and let the uric acid come back to normal, the blood pressure comes back to normal, but now they suddenly become sensitive to salt. They have become salt sensitive. If I flip them to a higher low salt diet, only the animals with the vascular lesions develop high salt or hypertension. And what we've shown is that the high blood pressure is going through two phases. There's an initial phase driven by uric acid. It's salt resistant. It's not related to the kidney. It's dependent upon nitric oxide. And then it switches to a kidney dependent hypertension that's salt sensitive volume dependent and so forth, and is not related to uric acid. And this actually mirrors what we know in human hypertension, where early hypertension is salt resistant and late hypertension salt sensitive, where early hypertension is associated with a high renin and low NO levels and a high uric acid, and where later hypertension is not. So it maps very well with human disease. So could uric acid be involved in high blood pressure? So we looked at to see whether or not uric acid predicted hypertension. And all 17 studies show that if you have a high uric acid, you're very likely to get high blood pressure in the next couple of years. Only one study couldn't show it by independent, as an independent risk factor, but that was for older people over the age of 60 where they already have vascular lesions. So we said if that's the case, then if uric acid is causing hypertension, we should see it in newly diagnosed hypertension. So we took children with newly diagnosed hypertension and we measured the uric acid and it was elevated in 90% of children with new onset hypertension. And it correlated directly with the blood pressure. It wasn't elevated in secondary hypertension. So we went on and we did a randomized double blind trial. We took 30 children with newly diagnosed hypertension. None of them had ever been treated with any kind of drug. And we gave them allopurinol or control. And their mean age was 15. These were fat kids with a BMI of 33. There was a mixture of them white, Hispanic, and African-American. And when we gave them the allopurinol, 66% became normal tensive. And if we actually looked at the ones who took their drug and lowered the uric acid, 86% became normal tensive versus 3% of the control group. So this has been very exciting. The NIH has invited us to come in with a multi-center trial to see if we can prevent essential hypertension. But while I was doing this, I realized that fructose, by raising uric acid and inhibiting nitric oxide, would completely block the effects of glucose to stimulate insulin uh, to, a great, to increase glucose uptake in the muscle. One third of glucose's action is through nitric oxide. And I thought, if this goes up at the same time, fructose might be the cause of insulin resistance in humans. So what we did is, and uric acid, through uric acid, so what we did is we took rats and we gave them very high doses of fructose, we can do it with small doses if we inhibit uricase. 